In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good gifts and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I'm going to jump right into it. So, we've gotten through the Pentateuch, we've gotten through the first five books, the foundational law. And for most of Israel's history, that's the scriptures. Everything else in the Old Testament is really compiled and started to, and, and really like becomes uh, received or understood or recognized as scriptural much, 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 much later, post-exile, during exile, that kind of time period. All through the rest of the, uh, the time of the judges and the kings, everything like that, when you see references to the scriptures or anything like that, they mean the five books of the law. This part starts what is sometimes referred to as the Deuteronomistic history. It spans from Joshua all the way through the exile. So Joshua, Judges, and then the four books of kingdoms, uh, which are also known as 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. All of that is a kind of single work, this grand history of Israel that is especially mindful of the book of Deuteronomy, especially mindful of the, the words that Moses gave in his injunction to live, live out the law. If you do well, then it will be well for you. And if you do not follow the law, it will be poorly for you. And that's the pervading theme through the rest of basically the Old Testament, but especially this chunk, uh, this history here. So, Tonight we're going to go over Joshua and Judges, and they are basically opposites of each other. Joshua is the story of things going well, because the Israelites are doing stuff all right, and Judges is the story of things going poorly, because the Israelites are doing all the wrong things. So we'll see a big journey up with Joshua, and then a downward spiral of doom all throughout Judges, basically. So... Just like as we've been seeing, um, especially with Deuteronomy, it was really concerned with like the how and the why and the what that Israel's doing. Israel's supposed to come into the land and get rid of the demons and stop demon worship from happening. And how they're going to do this is by living out the law. And why they're going to do this is because God desires to draw all nations unto him and he desires to make Israel this sort of priesthood of the world so that eventually all of the demons can get gotten rid of um, and humanity can be what it was supposed to be in the garden. Joshua is pretty good at this, all things considered. Um, we're shown at the beginning of Joshua, he is made as a new Moses. Very explicitly, God is like, my servant Moses is now dead and you are now the person in charge. And he basically makes Joshua the new Moses. And we get several signs. They're going to cross the Jordan River, just like Moses had them cross over the Red Sea. We're going to see um, Joshua is going to have a meeting with God face to face, just like Moses used to talk to God face to face. You're going to have lots of stuff to do with the Ark. Joshua is going to be in charge. He's going to be judging disputes between people. He's doing all of the things that we saw Moses doing. Some big themes that get throughout the whole book. You get this constant phrase, do not fear or be dismayed. Rather, be strong and courageous. Constantly throughout the book of Joshua, you get this constant, do not be do not be afraid or dismayed, but be strong and courageous. And the, the opening of the book really is when Joshua uh, talks to the angel of the Lord, when he talks to Christ. 
And the opening of that is very, very interesting. He sees the angel of the Lord and he bows down to him and he asks, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the response that Christ gives is no. That is the response that he gives. Joshua, are you for us or for you? Are you for our enemies? He says, no, that's the wrong question. Because God is trying to teach the Israelites that he isn't like the demons. He isn't like the pagan gods. He is not just the God of some specific little area of land. He is not the God of some ethnic group. And so as long as you belong to that ethnic group, he's with you. He is not a God who's trying to like carve out his his little plot among the gods. He's fundamentally different. And just like we saw with Moses, being Moses wasn't a full proof, you know, sure thing that he was going to always be within God's uh, good graces and that he was going to be doing this because it requires sanctity. God isn't just going to fight for Israel no matter what. It depends. Depends on Israel's faithfulness. And so when Joshua asks, are you for us or are you for your enemies? God's like, no, that's not how this works. You, are you for me or are you for the enemies? That's the bit, that's the better question. Um, it's not that Israel is the locus and the focus point that everything hinges upon. God is the locus and focus point that everything hinges upon. It's not about God being on someone's side. It's about you being on God's side. He is going to fight his battles. Um, we also get at this point, um, the entire generation that wandered through the desert has not been circumcised. So Joshua takes care of that. And they cross over the Jordan. And on the other side of the Jordan is when they get there right as Passover begins. So they're circumcised and they have Passover. And that's also the day on which the manna stops appearing. And so from that day forward, Israel is eating of the fruits of the land. They are no longer being given the manna. And so just like when Moses pulled them over the Red Sea, and we see in that this mystery of also the the initiation into the body of Christ in the church. Also, we see here with Joshua going over the Jordan, and that coincides with circumcision and Passover, which are the two rituals that make you part of the body of Christ. And rituals making you part of something and having your identity wrapped up in the ritual life is going to be very important for understanding Joshua and Judges. One line that stuck out to me that I thought was interesting. Um, He has, uh, as they're walking in, they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And Joshua tells them, don't pass the Ark of the Covenant. Don't walk in front of it. Reason being, you've never been here before. You don't know where you're going. And I don't have any time to try and like dig into that at all. But I thought that that was a, just a really neat phrase that stuck out to me as something to just spend more time thinking about. Um, is Joshua makes it very clear. God has to lead the way. You have no idea what you're doing. You have to follow God. You, if you walk in front of God, you're going to get messed up. You're going to get lost immediately. All right. They get to a place called Jericho. And Joshua sends spies in, just like Moses sent spies in, one of whom happened to have been Joshua. Two spies go to Jericho. They meet this woman named Rahab. Rahab is a member of this Jericho demon cult people city thing. And she ends up housing and protecting them in exchange for her life and the life of her family. She more Basically what she is doing is that she's agreeing to become an Israelite. So when the Israelites come and defeat Jericho, 
she isn't treated like someone from Jericho. She's treated as an Israelite. Her life is spared. And this is the main theme of the conquest of the land, is it's not really about a particular people group coming in and eliminating a bunch of other ethnic groups, which is how it's often uh, viewed uh, by people who don't know how it works. The way that Israel is going into the land and that we're being taught step by step with Jericho, but we're being taught it kind of step by step with Jericho because we should be understanding that it's the same with every city that comes afterwards. Jericho's not the exception. Jericho's the example of what goes on. Primarily, the way that they attack these cities is by doing a liturgical procession. They go to the city and against the demon cult in the city, they do the liturgical worship of God Most High. For a while, effectively what they're doing is offering to the people of Jericho, God Most High has come to claim back the land from the demons. Again, it's not, remember Joshua's question to the Lord, are you for us or are you for them? And the Lord says, that is the wrong question. The question is, are you for God or are you for the demons? Where are you at, O human? Because it's not about whether or not God is fighting for you, really. It's our who are you fighting for? Which side are you on? And at Jericho, we get the wonderful example of Rahab. Specifically, we're shown that anyone who says, yeah, down, done with this whole demon thing, I'll join Israel. Cool, great. That's what's that's the hope. That's what's supposed to happen. Unless everyone in the city does that, <laughs> then that's when God tears down the walls of Jericho himself and the Israelites go in and remove all of the people who said, nope, I'm sticking with my demons. Okay, well, then we have to remove all of that from the land. That's what happens at Jericho. Right after Jericho, we get the uh, the conquest of a city called Ai. Ai. I've heard this pronounced a million ways. It's literally just the letter A and the letter I is its name. I'm going to pronounce it I because that's kind of how it was pronounced in Hebrew. Um, they get to I and they're like, yeah, cool, great. Jericho is great. We're just going to rush in. And they go straight to I to attack. And they're miserably defeated kind of immediately. And Joshua is just like, what is happening? So he like, uh, he like throws himself on the ground or something like that. And he's like, God, why have you forsaken us? Why, why is this horrible thing happened to us? I thought you were with us. And I, think, and I love the next section because I couldn't not read it in this voice. Uh, it says the angel of the Lord came up to him and says the following words, get up. Why are you lying on the ground? <laughs> and I just could not not read that as, what are you doing? Get up. <laughs> what is happening right now? Um, and he says, this is why I already told you. If you follow the commandments, you will conquer. If you don't, you won't. Joshua, let, walk, walk, me th- walk through this with me. I didn't get immediately conquered. The thing that causes stuff to not get immediately conquered is sin. Joshua, what do you think happened? Oh, Israel must have sinned. He's like, thank you, Joshua. <laughs> you have figured it out. Uh, what has happened is this guy named Achan has um, one of the commands with Jericho was you don't keep any of the stuff. All of the stuff in Jericho either gets destroyed or given to the temple. Either it is completely purged from the land or it is dedicated to God Most High to be purified. Achan has decided that that's dumb and he wants to keep some gold and silver for himself. So he has done this. They search him out. God reveals who Achan is. And Achan is then taken out of the camp of Israel. And he is treated like the Jerichoite that he has desired to become. He is killed. And then all the stuff is burnt. So they, again, it's not an ethnic thing. It's not, if you're, it's not Israelites coming in and just like committing genocide. It's if you worship demons, 
Death is what happens to you. If you worship God most high, life is what happens to you. Just like, I mean, and physical life and physical death being understood as kind of the physical manifestation or the physical sign. Uh, we talked about that with, um, with Abraham. The promise to Abraham is that his descendants will be numerous and they will be like the stars and that they're going to bring the salvation of the world through his descendants. The physical sign of that promise is this like plot of land. And so when we think of a word, any word, but if we think of a word, especially if we're in this, in this context, the primary meaning of a word is not its physical shadow. Just like if you say a person, the most important and primary meaning of the word person is not a human body. It's the person whose body that is. It's the spiritual, more real part of them. Um, that's the primary thing. So when we talk about life and death, in the Old Testament, we see a lot of physical life and a lot of physical death that we don't see as much of in the New Covenant. And it's not because something has dramatically changed about really God's promises. It's that in the Old Covenant, the physical sign was given. And that was kind of the primary means that God used to teach was by just giving the physical meaning of words. Whereas in the New Covenant, the hope is that people have become more spiritually mature and they don't need the physical signs in the same way. Um, so Achan is killed bodily as a physical sign of the fact that he is already dead. He has already aligned himself with death by becoming a member of this demon cult, by keeping the stuff for himself, by sinning against God Most High. Because you only have two choices. Either you are with God Most High, or you are not. <laughs> and you are with the demons. You are either on, on this side of the war or this side of the war. There is no middle ground. After they deal with Achan, the people go to Ai. They draw the people of Ai out by pretending to run away. And then they have an ambush group come in that destroys the city while Ai is, gone, while Ai is out. And the way that I knows that they have been defeated is they turn around and they see a column of smoke coming up from their city. Keep that image in your mind. It comes up later. So Jericho and I, those are your kind of primary example cities of how this conquest goes. Then we get, not just with cities, but with the people, we get the Gibeonites and then the various other Canaanite kings. What happens here is that the Gibeonites... Uh, basically lie to Israel, but what they do is they basically say, don't kill us. You can just have our city. And if you don't kill us, we'll just join you. And there's like some rough rockiness, or something, but effectively what ends up happening is that they're like, yeah. And the Gibeonites are not destroyed. They become Israelites to some degree. Um, they don't they don't necessarily all become Israelites. It's kind of this weird thing. They just, they're just they just allowed to live because Israel has promised not to kill them. And then they find out that they're one of these groups. Um, but the idea being that even in this small way that Gibeon has uh, allied themselves with the Israelites, the idea is that they don't die. Whereas the other Canaanite kings are just like, wow, the Gibeonites are very silly and very weak now. We should attack the Gibeonites. Jeez. So they come and attack, and then Israel helps fight, and the Lord helps fight for the Gibeonites, and so the Canaanite kings are destroyed. So, again, showcasing that the point of this conquest is, or maybe the whole thing is, humans aren't the enemy. Ever, under any circumstances, are humans the enemy. Demons are the enemy. Humans who have been deceived by the demons often fight for the demons or do things for the demon or, or align themselves with the enemy, but they aren't the enemy until they make sort of the fundamental choice, until they can't repent anymore. They die, they become demonized, and they become a hell-bound soul. Then they're like the demons, fine. The giants are like the demons, fine. 
But the, the average person that you come across is like, no, the average person in Jericho is not committing child sacrifice. Just because like the priesthood of Jericho is doing that kind of stuff does not mean the average person in Jericho is somehow this horrible, horrible thing. It, it comes down to this, this fundamental reality that the war is not really between Israel and these other humans. The war is fundamentally the demons have rebelled against God and God is going to drive them out. Humans are caught up in all of this. And so humans pick sides, but they are not, they do not primarily constitute either side. Then we get a spot where after the defeat of all these kings, it's over the course of years and years and years, it gets really condensed. Um, Joshua then divides the land among the children of Israel. This recalls to mind the Tower of Babel and the divvying out of the nations to the different angelic principalities. Now, those principalities fell. They're being removed and replaced. And Israel is now coming in as the patrons of these areas. Um, or really, right now, they're coming in as the physical sign of the patron of these areas. Because uh, they're not, you know, whatever. We'll get to the new covenant at some point. Um, but this shows us God's plan is he's dividing up the nations now according to the sons of Israel, not according to the angelic principalities who fell. And then Joshua ends it by saying, I'm very old. I'm going to die. Do the things that Moses said to do. And then he sets up this altar as a witness to all of Israel. And all of Israel says, yes. Whatever the Lord commands, we'll do it. That's our thing. That's our whole bit. And it takes full on two sentences into the next book for that to fall apart. So there's our halfway point. That's the book of Joshua. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Complaints? You mentioned earlier not as such an exposed to say way of conducting war outlined in the book of Deuteronomy. Yes. The Israelites. Yes. So. That's like, more or less what we see at Jericho. Okay. In some ways. So the first, you have to show up and you have to basically say, this is the deal. God most high, demon God. Choose. They have to be allowed to make that choice. And then the consequences of that choice are meted out. Either they join God Most High and live, or they stay with the demon God and death is the wages of sin. So it doesn't mention that it's in their war with I, but is it just taken for granted that that's what they do? It's not mentioned in their war with I, and it's one of the reasons that they fail at the beginning, is they just run to I with swords ablazing. Okay. And they don't win because they haven't done what they're supposed to do. It's then there's some time then that stuff happens. And then you have people come in and stuff like that. Um, the idea being, if we see a successful conquest of any city, we are to understand that they have done what Deuteronomy has asked. That's how the Deuteronomistic history works. It really throws all details under the bus. Typically, you get like one really detailed account ever, and that shows you like the big thing. Um, but the idea of anything from the book of Joshua Judges and one through four kingdoms, the idea is if someone is if someone is shown as positive, it means they're doing everything Deuteronomy asks. If they're shown as negative, it means they're not doing the thing Deuteronomy asks. So yes, we are led to assume that that is also what they do for I. It's what they do for Gibeon. It's what they do for all. Then you get a list. I will not bore you by reading the list of cities <laughs> at one point. All right. Things are currently going pretty okay in Israel. Let's watch that fall apart. Here's the book of Judges. A quick note on what a judge is. Remember how Moses, the first thing we're told that Moses does when all the people are out of Egypt is that he sits down and everyone who has problems, they come to Moses and he figures out their problems. That's what the judges do. You know how Moses is also the absolute military commander and he's like the spiritual leader, like he's all the things. That's what these judges are. They are all in one leaders. 
basically. The only thing they aren't is priests. And that's because the priesthood was pulled out and not given to Moses. It was given to the separate line through Aaron. But every other kind of authority that happens in Israel, that's where the judges are. They are like priest kings in some sense. There are 12 of them in the book of Judges. Here are their names in order. I will talk about some of them. They are Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Slash, Barak. We'll talk about that when we get there. Gideon, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibsan, Abdon, and Samson. And then we'll get one last judge, Samuel. So we'll get to him later. Yeah. It's our guy named after Samuel. So here. All right. The book of Judges is basically this cycle. And this is what we get at the beginning. Basically, chapter two shows us this. The Israelites start sinning. And so God, uh, like we talked about it with the flood, it's not so much that God, like, God didn't, like, send the flood in, like, he let in, like, sort of an active, like, this what he does, I mean, he like he wills it, but the way he does it is um, every time you sin, you should drop dead by justice. You don't, and that's a good thing. <laughs> but every time you sin, you should drop dead. Like that's that's the wages of sin. God protects us pretty darn regularly <laughs> from that kind of thing happening. When we see things like the exile, which is promised at the end of Joshua, oh, I should say that. The end of Joshua, he says, if you don't do this, all the land that's been given to you, it'll be taken away. So he predicts the exile. When we see the exile, when we see the flood, when we see all these different things, when we see the fire that comes out from heaven that consumes the priests who offer strange incense. Think of it less as all of a sudden God was like, that's it, and smites them. It's more like God says, fine. You want the consequences of your actions, here are the consequences of your actions. And he basically removes the artificial protection and natural consequences take their course. So with the flood, there's so much, there's all this corruption and eventually God says, have your corruption then. And he removes the artificial protection and that's when the world kind of uncreates itself. The creation of the world was the separation of stuff. The flood is that the things come crashing all together and the waters over. It's basically just undoing the days of creation. When we see with the, the strange fire, they burned strange incense so that they would not be killed by the presence of God. And unfortunately, it was the strange incense that God said, no, that's not enough. And I'm here now and you've not protected yourself correctly. Here are the consequences of your actions and they die. The, the normal thing that should happen to them is what happens to them. Um, so with the judges cycle, this is what we see. When the people sin and they fall away from the law and they are no longer doing their job, which we should understand tip, prototypically means they're sacrificing to demons. They're doing demon worship. They're becoming Canaanites. That's the prototypical sin is that they are, they are becoming they are joining the other side of the war. And God basically says, I guess if you want to fight against me, and that's really the choice you're making, I can find this is what that's like. And then he'll have he'll let he'll let some foreign power come in and take over, reduce all the Israelites to abject slavery, just like Egypt. And then the Israelites realize that that sucks. So they pray and beg that God would uh send them some kind of salvation from this horrible slavery and they start doing good things again they start doing the stuff again and god raises up one of these judges and this judge has the spirit of god and is able to get the foreign invader out and brings peace to israel and then the judge dies and everyone in Israel is really comfortable. They're like, life is great. Everything's cool. I'm going to do a little demon worship just to spice things up. And it, it spirals. And then you get this cycle over and over and over and over and over again, where basically what we learn in a lot of ways, the big takeaway from the judges cycle is 
be really careful when you're comfortable. When you're comfortable and your bills are paid and you've got a job and you've got a roof over your like everyone, when you have comfort, be really careful not to take it for granted and to let prayer go and to stop being the priesthood of the world and to basically hand yourself over to the demons, the demons of pleasure and laziness and whatever. That's what happens. Um, it also shows us, and this is something I'll talk more about when we get to Saul for a very specific reason. Um, when we experience tragedy, when we experience evil, when we experience suffering and this kind of slavery going on, that should be to us, that's a sign that we need to repent. God allows this to happen to us to spur us on to repentance. It's punishment in the sense that the, the, the punishment that doesn't just kill you, uh, which is God just being like, I have done everything I can and there you are not. There's no hope for you at this point because I can see the future. Um, is that this is like, look, this is what happens when you are bad. Bad things happen. The world gets worse. You are, I'm letting you experience the corruption of the world. Please don't be like it. <laughs> Please repent and join the, and, and even stronger. And then even when someone's like not, like when a saint is experiencing the suffering of the world, it's not necessarily so much that the saint has it, although we all sin, even the saints are still dealing with sin. His, he's allowing the saint to deal with sin, to take that and purify it and bring it to the Lord. And so whenever something bad happens to us, we should be grateful for God's reminder and medicine, and we should repent. And then when something good happens to us, we should be grateful for the blessings of the Lord, and we should repent. <laughs> always repenting, always turning to God. Again, Joshua's question was wrong. It's not, hey, God, are you for us or are you for the enemies? It's, hey, me, am I for God or am I for the enemies? And this is something Joshua actually, at the end of the book of Joshua, he gets it in a big way. He says, you, you, you have to pick a master. Either you will serve the Lord or you will serve the demons. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. It's for that very famous, like, it's stitched on the pillows and things like that comes from. It's that end of Joshua where he says, you have a fundamental choice. All right. Othniel, he's the first judge. And he, it, it's so, it's like one verse. And he's like, Israel did bad things. Israel fell into slavery to foreign power. Israel was very sad and they asked God to help them. God decided to help them. He brought up a judge. His name was Othniel. He's like, uh, remember Joshua and Caleb were the two good spies. Uh, it's like Caleb's nephew or something is Othniel. They're related somehow, I forget. Anyway, Othniel was a judge. He judged Israel. He defeated the foreign invader. There was peace in Israel. Othniel lived for this many more years and there was peace in the land. And then the next, and then it's like, and then Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And this is, and you, get, you get the next judge. But Othniel is that very classic, just here's what the whole book's about. Memorize this Othniel bit, and you'll see that happening. Then you get Ehud and Shamgar, who don't matter. Um, they do matter. It's just that we're going to skip over them. Some of the some of these judges get just one verse, and it's just like like Shamgar. It's like, and then Shamgar was a judge, and then we move on because. I don't need to tell you the whole story of the judges again. You know what happened. You know that Israel sinned and under slavery and then Shamgar came out. You know all that. All I have to do is say Shamgar was a judge and you know everything he did. The next judge is Deborah. Deborah's not supposed to be the judge. Barak is supposed to be the judge. But Barak sucks. And he's not very good at this. And we find this out because Deborah is the one who's introduced as judging Israel. And Deborah is judging Israel. And then this, this evil comes up and Barak, like it's wild because Barak comes up to Deborah and it's just like, what should we do? And her response is, didn't the Lord command you to like raise up armies and attack? Like Barak, do your job. You're the judge. 
I'm over here picking up the slack for you, but you're the act. Go. And then Barack is like, do you promise you'll be there too? She's like, oh my gosh, yes, fine, I'll be there. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so she goes, but you are, getting, you are getting no glory out of this. No one in Israel will remember you. And uh, frankly, if I didn't reread the book of Judges, I would not have remembered Barak's name because you only hear about Deborah. <laughs> um, they go, they fight, they attack. It's great. The big enemy is this general named Sisera. Barak does not get to kill Sisera. Sisera is killed by some lady in a tent with like a, a, a nail. It's the whole thing. I'll let you read it to get the details and the stuff that's cool. What we should realize is Othniel was pretty good. Ehud and Shamgar, fine. Barak, not so good. And so God has to like bring up this like second judge, Deborah, like at the same time kind of thing. Um, Barak is not being strong and courageous. He's being fearful and dismayed. Oh yeah, it's that thing that brought up in Joshua all the time. Don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. Rather be courageous and um, courageous and strong. Barak is not in fact doing that. And that's not good. You get this really cool song. I'll let you read it. It's a very cool song that Deborah and Barak sing. Okay, the next one that we get is Gideon. And Gideon's another one of these kind of big judges. Lots of chapters about him. I'm going to skip most of the stuff that happens to Gideon because he's really cool, but you should go read the book of Judges. It's not like Leviticus. It's very readable. <laughs> it's very readable. It's got a great plot. I highly recommend reading the book of Judges. Um, I highly recommend reading the book of Leviticus too, but it's work to get through Leviticus. Judges is just like good stories. Um, Gideon's a coward. Frankly, he's a coward. Um... He does get better. He's got all these different things where God comes in and is just like, hey, Gideon, I'd like you to go attack these people. And he's like, I don't know. That scene sounds really dangerous. And God's like, yeah, it's called a war for a reason. Anyway, so Gideon's like, all right, here's the famous thing from Gideon. Lord, prove to me it's you. He's face to face with Jesus at this moment. But she's like, prove to me it's you. I'm going to leave this, like, piece of wool out. In the morning, if you could make it so that dew is only on the wool and not on any of the ground, then I'll know it's you. He goes to bed, he gets up, he walks out. We're told the, the wool is so wet with dew that he wrings it out and fills a whole bowl of water. And there's no water on any of the ground. And he goes, now, hear me out, Lord. It's not that I'm testing you. I'm definitely not putting the Lord to the test. I just need one more miracle before I'm like totally in. Could you make it so the, so the fleece is completely dry and the rest of the ground is wet with dew? Then I'll know it's you. And rather than smiting him then and there, <laughs> the Lord is very merciful to Gideon. And he goes to bed and he wakes up in the morning and it's like that. The, the fleece is dry as all get out and there's dew all over the ground. And Gideon's like, I think this means I have to go to war, I guess. I think I feel like I made a promise. So he goes, shenanigans happen, he's victorious. Um, what we get with Gideon towards it, he gets better. He actually ends up becoming decent by the end. Except, at the very end, everyone's like, Gideon, do you want to just be like king? And Gideon responds the way he should when he says, No! I will not be king. My son will not be king. My grandson will not be king. I refuse. God is your king. God is the Lord of Israel. Because in this world, when you say a king, the only kings the Israelites have ever come into contact with are giants. The only kings the Israelites know about are the giants. Pharaoh and Sihon and Og and uh, I didn't tell you about uh, his name. Oh, what's his name? Now I'm going to forget. Elgon? Eglion? Eglon? I think it's Eglon. Anyway, he's this massive man. Uh, it's the, Ehud is the judge that fights him. He's this huge guy. He's, oh, he's literally a giant, but he's also this evil, wicked, horrible person. Um, the way that Ehud ends up killing him is he stabs him with a sword. But he stabs him with a sword so far 
that it just like goes into like his fat rolls and the sword is like it's read the book of judges <laughs> boy do some stuff happen uh i wouldn't like read it to my like my small children before bed uh which i suppose technically is kind of what i'm doing right now anyway read the book of judges it's very fun anyway giants are the only kings when the israelites can hey gideon do you want to be king what they're asking gideon to do is to be a giant to be a demon king to be to to be this strong man to be just like the other nations etc it's precisely the question they're going to ask samuel later when they say look we really would love a king. We'd like a king. And then the phrase they use in the book of uh, kingdoms is put over us a king like the other nations have. Like they're even really specific about it with him. Anyway, Gideon says no. <laughs> what he does say um, is give me your earrings. And he takes your earrings and he makes a freaking golden calf. <laughs> and he sets that up and he's like, worship that if you have to, basically. <laughs> uh, and it says, and that idol was a stumbling block for Gideon and his whole family and all of Israel forever and ever. <laughs> um, and then he doesn't even get his wish. His son Abimelech becomes a king. It's the worst. Anyway, I'll skip over Abimelech. Just now Abimelech basically tries to set himself up as a king by like attacking. He like kills all of his brothers uh, and he like sets himself up as a king, and there's a prophecy that says that's put against him, and he actually ends up getting ousted by his own people after a short time. So we get Tola, we get Jair, we get Jephthah, we get Ibsen, we get Abdon, all judges I'm not going to talk about. And then we got to the judge that you came here for, it's Samson. Samson is very cool, totally sick, super metal. I wouldn't necessarily name my kid after him, he's not. Saint Samson at all. You just did. He's not Saint Samson, and that's like a meaningful thing. He's not in any Synaxarian ever throughout the entire history of the church. He has never been recognized as a saint. He never will be. Um, even Jonah is Saint Jonah because he got better. Samson's bad. Um, I'm going to use a fairly modern way of talking about this. Samson is not really a demon worshiper. Really. Um, he's not like the thing about it. He is giant coded to use a wild phrase that's uh, come into more like um, literary analysis stuff like that. He's giant coded. He's really strong. He's a brute. He kills lots of people, sleeps with lots of women, and he's just kind of this like, he's all the things that the giants are, basically. Except he technically serves the Lord God of Israel, kind of. <laughs> uh, God works through him a lot, um, but he's not good. He eventually, what ends up happening, he's got like all these stories where he like deceives people. He like, try and not, and not even like in the deceives people, deceiving evil people in order to conquer demons kind of way. He's like, just like trying to get rich by deceiving people and getting them to pay him like thousands of dollars and stuff for and all kinds of stuff. He ends up getting married to this lady named Delilah, who is actually, I don't think they married. Anyway, he's with Delilah and she is a Canaanite and he basically be the, the thing to get from Samson is that he has married himself to foreign gods. He has, he is embodying what's going wrong with Israel is they are aligning themselves to the Canaanite gods. They are marrying themselves to this demonic power rather than being the people of God and being the bride of God. They are making themselves the bride of demons. Uh, he ends up uh, dating this lady named Delilah and I, fully, she's like, Samson, I just don't understand how you're so strong. What would it take for me to tie you up and murder you? And he's like, and then he lies to her and he's like, uh, you have to use spider webs or something, some, whatever. So she like gets Philistine like people to like tie him up with spider webs. And then 
And then she yells something like, Samson, they've got you. And then he breaks out of it because it's a total lie. He like, kills them all. It's super metal. Um, but then she walks up to him and she's like, Samson, I just like, oh, you lied to me. I just like really wish you would tell me how to tie you up and murder you. And he like doesn't dump her. He's like, you have to use ropes that have never been tied around anything before. So she like has a bunch of like thugs come and tie him up with ropes that have never been tied around stuff before. And then she's like, Samson, oh no, they've got you, I guess. And then he's like, and he busts out of it and kills him on, it's wild. At a certain point, <laughs> it's just like, it's like the worst movie plot ever because you see the whole thing going. Eventually she, eventually she just gets him drunk, which he's a Nazarite, which means he's not supposed to drink alcohol or cut his hair. That's the thing. She gets him drunk. So that's the thing. And she's like, what makes you so strong? And he goes, it's all this hair that I have. I'm a Nazarite, so I'm not supposed to drink alcohol or cut my hair ever. If I do those things, then I won't be big and strong. And she's like, all right. So she cuts his hair. Uh, then he wakes up and he's like been all like tied up and stuff like that. And she goes, Samson, they've got you. And he's like, it's all right, babe. I'm just... And then he can't break out because he got drunk and had his hair cut. Um, so they gouge out both of his eyes. They tie him up in a temple and uh, they have him tied up for so long. His hair starts to grow back. Um, and, and as he's like in this temple, he's like tied up. And there's like the attendant boy, whatever. And he goes, attendant boy, can you uh, loosen my hands a little bit so I can touch the pillars on this temple? I just need to rest against them for a little bit. And he does. So he puts his hand in and he goes, basically, he's, it's, it's just like, what a wild ending. He basically is just like, Lord God, I have sinned. Let me die with these Philistine dogs. And he pushes the temple and the whole temple falls down and kills everyone inside And that's the end of Samson's story. Um, he's a lot. Um, there's, not, there's not a lot of good stuff to say about Samson. He's very cool. You can see why the Israelites would want a king like this. He's very cool. Um, there's a reason he's the judge. You all remember. There's a reason he's on the... Every time I... Every YouTube video I Googled that, uh, like, I just, like, Googled it. What do people think about the judges? They're all pictures of Samson, like ripped out, pushing a temple that like everyone remembers that story. He's not the hero. And I think that shows us like, yeah, we have the same problem that Israel does. We like things that are awesome and cool and totally sick, but we don't necessarily like good things. And so that's the lesson with Samson, I think, is that he's so much more fun to read than like some of the other people in this book, but he's not a good guy. He's not the hero of the story. He's God working through an extremely corrupt individual. Um, and then we get the end of the book of Judges, which, um, so we've just seen how the, the leaders of Israel are falling apart. Here's some people. This guy named Micah. Uh, well, first off, now we get this phrase that repeats several times. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone was the arb their own arbiter of what is good and what is true. The people became complete subjectivists. There, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And, and remember, it's not that there was no human king in Israel. We already know that. That's not the, that's not the, what it means in the book of Judges for it to say there's no king in Israel. The, duh, there's no king in Israel. But what it means is, God is not their king. They have totally left that. They have utterly forsaken God as Lord. They're not following the law at all. Remember, the law is a list of instructions about what is and isn't good. We get, there's no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. No one is following the law. Israel has, followed, Israel has become full on just a Canaanite group at this point. You get this guy named Micah. He's real rich, and he builds his own god. And then this Levite is traveling through, and he says, Hey, Levite guy, you want to be a priest? And the Levite's like, I've always kind of wanted to be a priest. So Micah makes him a priest, and so Micah's got this... Okay, 
He's just some guy. And in his backyard, he's got like a full-on temple with an idol in it. And his personal little Levite priest guy who does like little sacrifices in the backyard. Like that's what this guy is like. Anyway. And he, he's, he's like, cool, I've got my own private priest. Like, And he's like, now I'm going to be blessed by God because I have a Levite for a priest for me. And it's like the delusion of this man. The Russians have a word for this. It's prelist. <laughs> like absolute delusion. He set up an idol and he, he, Micah, ordains the guy a priest. Clearly not like so many things have gone wrong. It's like one of those situations you walk into and someone says, yeah, what about this? And you can't even begin to respond because every step of that sentence is wrong. There's not a single presupposition that I agree with that goes into that question. If, if someone came with my gun and he was just like, yeah, isn't this cool? I'd be like, I don't even know where to begin to tell you that this is not cool. <laughs> this is not okay. Anyway, People from Dan come down and they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that this Micah guy's got his own private priest. I think that's pretty sweet. They go attack a city, whatever. They come back and they steal Micah's god and his priest. And they bring him back up to Dan. And because that's where the Levite was from. He had been living among the Danites. And they were like, do you want to be the priest of just like one dude or like the priest of a whole tribe of Israel? And Micah's like, or the priest is like, I'll be the priest of a whole tribe of Israel to the demon God. Yes, that's awesome. So they go up and that's what they do. That's one of the two stories at the end of the book of Judges. The other one is horrifying. So I will not go into details on the second one. Basically, in the tribe of Benjamin, you get Sodom and Gomorrah 2, Electric Boogaloo. Um, Except it even worse because no one stops them. There's, their city is not destroyed by fire before they can harm someone. They full, full on, maybe don't read the last bit of Judges. It's really horrific what happens. Anyway, um, and the way it's made known to Israel is horrific. There's just like a lot going on. What ends up happening is the rest of the tribes of Israel are like, that's not good. We cannot let that happen in Israel. That's, that's bad. So they all go to war with, with this city in Benjamin. And they they destroy the city. They beat the city. We are told that the way the people in the city knew that they had been defeated is that they turned around and they saw a column of smoke coming from the city. So it's being described exactly like way, way back at the beginning of Joshua, the city of Ai, a demon cult city. This city in Benjamin, this Israelite city in Benjamin, has just been referred to in the same exact imagery as one of the demon cult cities that Israel was supposed to wipe utterly from the face of the earth. Um, yeah. So they get just, they get defeated. There's this like whole thing about no one in Israel is going to let a Benjaminite ever marry their kids again. There's stuff like that, which is not the important takeaway part, part necessarily. Um, but just to realize like, that's how bad it's gotten in Israel. In like 200 years? Max? I don't remember. Most of the judges judge Israel for like 30 to 40 years. So you get, I should have just done this for like the actual amount of time. It's not like a long time. It's not like one generation. But it's like bad. We were like at the height of, at the end of the book of Joshua, it straight up just says, and the Lord had fulfilled every promise he had made to Abraham about the land. All of the land had been given to the Israelites. Everything was great. And by the end of the book of Judges, it's so bad that people don't even realize that setting up their own God in their backyard, self-ordaining a Levite as a demon priest, they don't even realize that that's bad. And we get Sodom and Gomorrah too which is the quintessential horrific sin in Genesis. Um, it's happening in Israel. It's happening in Benjamin, which is like Joseph's baby, like or Jacob's baby. Like this is the youngest child of Israel. Um, they're like a central, they're like a central tribe in the middle of, of the whole nation. So it get bad. And by the end of the book of Judges, everything is horrible. <laughs> That's when we get to next week and we start with like, here's Samuel. Know that Samuel is being born into this time when it's like, oh, 
Every everything is bad. Nothing is good. There's literally nothing good happening. It's very, it's very, very bad. So, questions, comments, concerns, complaints about the book of Judges. It's a wild book. I yeah. People who think the Old Testament is boring have only read Leviticus and have not, in fact, read the book of Judges <laughs> by any means. Joshua, there's that whole span in Joshua where it's just like, let me tell you a map. <laughs> no fun. There's like eight chapters of Joshua where it's just like, and these people's lands go from this river over to this little forest area up there, just like this city here. And then it comes right. I get it. Fine. You don't have to read that part of Joshua. None of Judges is boring. <laughs> Lots of Judges is bad, but none of Judges is boring. So, cool. Israel has become a demon cult. How could it get possibly any worse?